Hello, YouTube. Warbles on a lot here. Hmm. What's the matter? Perfect juxtaposition. I could not have asked for finer. What's wrong with shiny land, Phil? What's wrong with shiny land, Phil? What's wrong with shiny land, Phil? How useless can it be? Before I say on or tell any more, it's necessary to run on down a bit of a segue penned by Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell the pair of prize-winning science fiction writers who sold President Ronald Reagan on the idea of the Strategic Defence Initiative by which the excited status of Norte armed Americano bankrupted the United Soviet Socialist Union and led in the fall of communism. In this little segue, in a book titled The Moat in God's Eye, there's a scenario. We're just going to have to go there. In order to understand how and why it was that as soon as I saw it, even through the blister pack, I was fairly certain that this Chinesium bell and howl belt tool thingamajig was deliberately manufactured landfill, so I bought it in order to review it. And in here is how I come to knew it. So, let us take the proverbial mad scientist's close look at what's in the book. So the basic idea is that humans have moved out into space and built themselves an empire and then the empire's got to infight and then it's collapsed and now it's rebuilding the empire and all of a sudden on the kind of outposts of human space there arrives a light sail powered alien probe from a nearby solar system and in the nearby solar system evolution has taken some different paths so, of course, the re-emerging human imperium sends an exploratory force of naval vessels, space naval vessels, and they go and they have a look at this new civilization. And the bit that I'm going to read to you comes from a part in the book where the aliens have constructed an ambassadorial ship to meet the humans in orbit around the alien star in their planetary space. We won't go into any of the other details because they're not necessary to this discussion. Members of the human expeditionary crew have been aboard the ambassadorial ship and they're now back in their own ship and they're comparing notes, so to speak. Of the characters, Hardy is the bishop sent along by the Imperium 
to be with the expedition to determine the theological nature of the aliens. Whitbread is a petty officer on the spaceship. Uh, Sally is an anthropologist who happens to be the captain's girlfriend. David is Hardy. Uh, well, I don't know. Don't know. Uh, no, David is the captain, I think. Horvath is a scientist. Certainly, Horvath smiled. I've spoken to Captain Blaine, and he leaves it to our judgment. As he says, there's nothing secret on the cutter. However, I'd like there to be something a little special, some ceremony, wouldn't you think? After all, except for the asteroid miner, the Motis have never visited a human ship. Hardy shrugged. They make little enough of our coming aboard their craft. You want to remember, though, unless the whole Moti race is fantastically gifted at languages, a hypothesis I reject, they've had their special ceremony before they lifted off their planet. They've put language specialists aboard. I wouldn't be surprised to discover that our faiant cliques are the Moti equivalent of full professors. Whitbread shook his head. The others looked at him, and finally he spoke. He was rather proud of having worked out a technique to let a junior officer interrupt the others. Sir, that ship left the moat planet only hours, maybe less than one hour after MacArthur appeared in their system. How would they have time to gather specialists? I hadn't known that, Hardy said slowly, but these must be specialists of some kind. What use would such fantastic linguistic abilities be among the general population? And fantastic is not too strong a word. Still and all, we've managed to puzzle them slightly, or did the rest of you notice? The tool room, Sally asked. I guess that's what you'd call it. Although I don't think I'd have figured it out if Jonathan hadn't given me the clue first. They took me there just after I left you, Hardy, and they didn't seem puzzled to me. I noticed you stayed a lot longer than I did, though. What did you do there? David asked. Why, nothing. I looked at the gadgetry. The place was covered with junk, by the way. Those clamps were, weren't substantial enough to take real gravity, I'm sure of that. They must have built that room after they got here. But anyway, since there wasn't anything I could understand, I didn't pay much attention to the place. Hardy folded his hands in an attitude of prayer, then looked up embarrassed. He'd got into that habit long before he entered the priesthood, and somehow could never break himself of it. But it indicated concentration, not reverence. You did nothing, and they were not curious about it. He thought furiously for long seconds. Yet I asked the names of the equipment and spent quite a long time there, and my faience click seemed very surprised. I could be misinterpreting the emotion, but I really think my interest in the tools unsettled them. Did you try to use any of the gadgets? Whitbread asked. No. Did you? Well, I played around with some of the stuff. And were they surprised or curious about that? Jonathan shrugged. They were all watching me all the time. I didn't notice anything different. Yes, Hardy folded his hands again, but this time he didn't notice he was doing it. I think there's something odd about that room and the interest they showed in our interest in it. But I doubt we'll know why until Captain Blaine sends over his expert. Do you know who's coming? Orvath nodded. He's sending Chief Engineer Sinclair. Hmm. The sound was involuntary. The others looked at Jonathan Whitbread, who grinned slowly. If the Modis were puzzled by you, sir, just think what they'll go, what'll go through their heads when they hear Commander Sinclair talk. You see, it is their conceit that in any pan-solar galactic diaspora which reaches to the stars and beyond, people whose ancestors came from Scotland are going to speak a raw Scottish brog out there in the stars. And that being from Scotland, New Scotland, Neo Scott, they'll all be engineers as well, because that's what appeals to the prejudices of Niven and Purnell. So we run from page 205 to 209. There was more activity aboard the cutter. Commander Sinclair had gone on board and been immediately taken to the Modi ship. Three days passed before a brown and white began following Sinclair around and it was a peculiarly quiet Moti. It did seem interested in the cutter's machinery, unlike the others who had assigned themselves to a human. Sinclair and his faience clique spent long hours aboard the alien ship, poking into corners, examining everything. The lad was right about the tool room, Sinclair told Blaine during one of his daily reports. It's like the non-verbal intelligence tests Bupers worked up for new recruits. There are things wrong with some of the tools, and tis my task to put them right. Wrong how? 
Sinclair chuckled, remembering he had some difficulty explaining the joke to Blaine. The hammer with the big flat head would hit a thumb every time it needed to be trimmed. The laser heated too fast, and that was a tricky one. It generated the wrong frequency of light. Sinclair fixed it by doubling the frequency somehow. He also learned more about compact lasers than he'd ever known before. There were other tests like that. They're good, Captain. It took ingenuity to come up with some of the testing gadgets without giving away more than they did. But they cannot keep me from learning about their ship, Captain. I already can enough to redesign the ship's boats to be more efficient, or make millions of crowns designing minor ships. Retiring when we go back, Sandy? Rod asked, but he grinned widely to show he didn't mean it. In the second week, Rod Blaine also acquired a five-inch click, which turns out to be a special subspecies of moti devoted to studying one individual powerful important person. Five-inch click. I'm sure if I was a sand bushman from Africa, I could pronounce that glottal click, but yeah, I'm a monoglottal strain, so I can't be doing it. Anyway, now let's go and have a look at the bright and shiny landfill and see what's wrong with it. Here is the tack hammer from the upholstery shop of Wharton's Garage. See how it's got a slight domed face there so that you can hit the head of the tack without damaging the leather or the woven fabric. It's not a claw hammer, it's a tack hammer. That's so you can hold a really, really narrow tack and strike between your fingertips to get it started. Made to last, and it has. My grandfather bought that workshop in 1919 and I'm still using the hammer. A haftless hammer head, made in the USA, it says. See how the head is chamfered so that if you go close enough to hit your thumb you're not actually going to do much damage the skin will get out of the way it's engineered to be as safe as a hammer can be my guess is 1930s from the 1950s it's seen a fair bit more work it's got the same chamfered edge, the same tapered head. And the reason I'm thinking 1950s is it's got a, the remains of a fancy little doohickey, which once upon a time had something operating on a hinge and an axle in there. I'm assuming to dig out nails that were countersunk or pounded deeply in. And yeah, this one, like this one, has an elaborately, carefully shaped slot between the claws. So you can actually extract a nail. Here we have a late 1960s, I'm thinking 1967 perhaps, fiberglass handled non-breakable fiberglass handled and it too has a tapered head with a chamfer on the face to protect the skin of the user that's how you make hammers right it's a thing that's the dead giveaway parallel straight-sided round hammer cylindrical section head with sharp 90 degree edges this thing is designed to tear your thumb down to the bone that's the first thing you notice another thing there is a spring and in order to get the jaws to close on anything you have to overcome the power of that spring manually that's where the spring opens them to so yeah you've probably got to put four kilos maybe ten pounds into squeezing the pliers shut that's before you start thinking about using the wire cutters 
built into the bottom. The blade is actually sharp. It's quite soft metal. Tiny, weeny little Phillips head screwdriver. A significantly vicious looking pruning saw. Assuming you wanted to gnaw your way through a sapling that you could probably kick down with your foot. It's what I think is a fish hook remover on the very end, so pity help the poor fish as you saw his jaw off while attempting to remove the hook before you re-release it. Here we have a combination bread knife and what is functionally a chisel point. According to the fancy manufactured packaging blurb, that's supposed to be a screwdriver and on the obverse side it's got a nail file. Below it we have an oldy fashioned bottle opener Theoretically, a one, two, three, four sided hexagonal wrench. And the hex wrench has got a wider chisel point. The bread knife, the saw, and the conventional knife blade are all fearsomely sharp as delivered. Screwdrivers functionally useless, pliers don't grip, hammerhead is designed to chew a hole in the user's finger and thumb. You can only use the wire cutters if you want to exert the four kilograms of squeeze pressure before you start working on the wire. But the piece de resistance is what passes for the claw of the hammer. It won't engage a nail. It won't squeeze it enough to grip it, enough to pull it out of balsa wood. This has been manufactured deliberately to be thrown in landfill. I bought it from the gifty shoppy section of the Australia Posty office in Glen Innes. Branded Bell and Howell. The name of a once world famous company manufacturing 16 millimeter spring driven movie cameras with a three or four lens turret. Somewhere, somebody has come up with the funding to buy the raw materials, set up the factory's production tools, manufacture these things by the container load, encase them in polycarbonate bubbles and brightly printed inserts, distribute them around the world and sell them, in this case, in an Australian inland country town, for ten dollars so the retailer probably paid five dollars and the importer maybe brought them into the country for a dollar each and if you've got a chinese registered company owned by chinamen that Ch and you're exporting to anywhere in the world the chinese government gives you free postage but <sighs> bright and shiny landfill for thus we've trashed the earth Deliberately manufacturing a lot of bright, shiny bullshit that is useless, worthless, does nothing functional, and fills up landfill pits. How we got from this, through this, and this, to finish up here, Right there, in a hundred years, it's, it's kind of beyond my comprehension. It's happened in my lifetime, the worst of it. When I was a kid, if you spent a bit of money on a hammer, you got a decent hammer. Now for $10 in semi-indestructible packaging, you can get something that almost, but not quite, succeeds in impersonating a hole in the universe where it pretends to be a hammer. For such is the nature of perfect liberty and perfect responsibility. It absolutely includes complete freedom to choose wrong. And that's what we did 12,300 years ago at Gobekli Tepe, where Turkey is now. The broadacre agro cult of Carvest Everythingism began. And for the cult of shiny landfill! We thus have trashed the earth. Wobbles on a lot to YouTube.
Ciao.